So, um, as Rosie's mentioned, um, I'm Ros and with me tonight is Aidan and we work with the AF on their TORFS programme where we've developed the Modern Camden series. Um, there are many reasons as to why Aidan and us kind of chose Camden as the, the centre for our tours and, uh, you know, it's mainly because it's got this kind of high, you know, high concentration of what for us are kind of fantastic examples of kind of radical experimental and progressive housing schemes. Schemes that were very much kind of reacting against the status quo of their day. Um, the buildings that we visit on our walks um, are very much kind of products of their era. You know, you might, you know, very different to now, you know, it's an era of optimism, technical, technological innovation, um, and a time when the state was really leading housing provision in a way that kind of you know, encouraged and it provided an atmosphere where kind of young, hungry um, and idealistic architects had the opportunity to realise some of their ideas. Um, you know, Camden in the 1960s created a culture that, you know, arguably has provided some of the best social housing or council housing that this country has ever built. Um, so we've got two, two routes at the moment, what we call Camden One, which is North Camden, focuses on kind of Highgate, Gospel Oak and Hampstead. And that includes some kind of earlier examples of the era that we look at, particularly focused on kind of low rise, um, high density schemes. And then Camden Two, which was quite a kind of extensive research project where we discovered some, some really quite fantastic gems. Um, but that's a much more, that focuses much more on kind of central Camden, it's a different context, it's much more urban, and that's um, Holborn, Summerstown and King's Cross. Um, Aidan and I are sort of long-standing friends, um, you know, over the years we've had a kind of shared interest in the importance of housing, and I think that's housing across, you know, kind of a number of different levels. And um, if you think back in kind of 1919, housing was part of the Ministry of Health. You know, there's this idea that, you know, we have a, have a right, um, you know, we have a right to good housing. Um, and we're now kind of in the era of, you know, for the majority of us, housing is something quite unaffordable and is majoritively privatized. Um, but we're also interested in housing because it makes up, you know, a vast, the vast majority of our built environment and it affects not only how we feel inside it, but also how we kind of move around the city and how we experience the city, which is why a walking tour becomes, you know, really the sort of perfect medium for exploring these ideas. So we're going to give you a brief overview um, of kind of some of the themes that run through our tours and our interests, and hopefully it won't turn into too much of a history lecture. <laughs> um, Aiden. I'll try not to. Uh, yeah, so I'm going to give you uh, a brief history lesson that you probably all, already all know, uh, and that's why you're here. <laughs> but yeah, as Ross says, I'll try and be quick. Um, so in the, obviously in the immediate post-war years, um, uh, the country and potentially um, I suppose like Europe was characterized by a lot of bomb damage, but also this idea of a kind of all in it together milieu. Like I don't want to be too romantic because it's more complicated, but there was a sense that um, a new society could be made uh, and that could be a better society. Uh, so uh, in, in London, you have the Abercrombie plan and this is a new plan for London. And it, the, the idea of the Abercrombie plan, part of it is about densifying London uh, and um, yeah, and, and as a result of that, um, uh, or, or, or in that kind of time period, you have this acceptance of modernism slowly. I mean, in the 1940s and 50s, a bit less. By the 1960s, modernism is kind of accepted as the way, way to, to build this new society. Um, just, just to mention, this is Churchill Gardens by, by Paula Moyer on the Thames. And this is quite a, a kind of idealistic example and a very successful example of that type of um, mixed development housing. Um, by the late 1950s and early 60s, there's a reaction to high rise. Uh, so um, high rise becomes uh, kind of rolled out. It becomes the kind of one of the, one of the kind of main uh, sort of vehicles for architects and planners to achieve uh, high densities, um, or that's at least what they think. Um, and at the center of that is the idea of a user cycle and the idea that you can move families around between high blocks and low blocks. Um, that doesn't really work and you end up with families in tall tower blocks uh, and uh, by, as I say by the late 50s, early 60s you have a few reports, um, Peter Stone, Joe Maisels, um, uh, basically breaking the link between high rise and high density for one and also um, arguing that potentially 
high rise, you know, above the kind of eighth story, it's not very good, you know, if you're kind of, if you've got children playing, it's not maybe an appropriate form of housing. So you can kind of see this uh, view from Get High by Jonathan Mead sort of explaining that, that concept. Um, I'll leave Ros. So um, despite the kind of criticisms that Aidan's explained that are beginning to be levelled at high rise, with the assistance of the 1956 Housing Subsidies Act, kind of councils continued to sort of churn these out. You know, part of the act essentially was a new grant regime which paid more the higher councils bill. This, you know, was in part kind of recognition of the additional building costs, you know, um, associated with building high. And it was also part to encourage councils to do so. So on, on the slide here, you can see a still from Adam Curtis's documentary. And this is kind of tied up with corruption, um, corner cutting, and kind of worst of all, poor workmanship, um, which as we all know is sort of played out at the end of the decade um, with random points. Um, yeah, so uh, this kind of movement towards uh, mixed developments and high rise, uh, is famously inspired by, you know, a lot of, you know, the kind of international style and a lot of people. But Le Corbusier is potentially the most famous and the most influential. Uh, and um, uh, by the 1940s, Le Corbusier was actually moving away from some of those ideas. So in, in the 1920s, he'd been, you know, the famous Ville Radius and Charter Athens had been very much about high rise and machine for living kind of cities. You can see on the upper image, his plan for Marseille, where he's still using slab and point blocks, but potentially in a slightly less aggressive way. And then in, in the 40s, you can see, uh, sorry, by 1948, you can see uh, the, his plan for the permanent city, uh, Le Saint Baume, which was unrealized in the lower image. And that, that scheme was known as a mat scheme. So it's a different approach. Instead of uh, uh, objects in space, which is the kind of modernist mantra, uh, this is about building across an entire site and carving out spaces between. Um, so it's a, it's a kind of inverted uh, approach. Uh, and you can see at the same time, he came up with another scheme for Roque Rob, um, which is again unrealized. Um, and you can see in the, in the section, his justification for high density, low rise schemes was this idea that if you could build it into a, into a hillside, you could get light, air and views. So that's his kind of uh, vehicle for achieving it. Cool, so what you can see here is Siedeln Harlem by Atelier 5 architect and architects in Bern in Switzerland and this is this is realized this is a kind of physical manifestation of some of the ideas that Aidan was um, just discussing it's, it's not the only one that there, there were others in Northern Europe and across Scandinavia um, but this one this is one that became particularly influential to kind of young architects here in the UK so as we bring it you know, back, back to the UK, in London in the 1960s, you know, it was the AA, the Architectural Association, that was really kind of at the forefront leading the debate in terms of rethinking our approach to housing, challenging the accepted kind of status quo of the day, um, and, and particularly with that, the idea of high rise. Um, housing was very much part of the ethos of the school um, and you know, the, way, the way they kind of thought and taught. Um, it was part of the curriculum, all fifth year students had to study housing, um, you know, and at the time the students, you know, began uh, experimenting with instead of this idea of kind of stacking units, what happens if we kind of, you know, tightly pack them together, uh, you know, in, in these kind of stacked terraces, as you've just seen from, from Aiden's, Aiden's slide, and you create much more of, uh, of a landscape. Um, and it was these sort of experiments that began to bring us towards what we kind of now call um, low rise high density. Uh, amongst the students at the time, what you can see here, you've got Neve Brown, who, you know, go on to play a pivotal role, not only in Camden, but in kind of the com wider conversation about housing. And um, his castmates included Kenneth Frampton, Patrick Hodgkinson, who had also gone to work with Leslie Martin in Camden, first in Kendridge Town, and then going on to work on the now iconic Brunswick Centre. You know, I think it must have been a sort of really exciting atmosphere, you know, this kind of energised, questioning, seeking for alternatives, and with this really sort of genuine ambition of wanting something better. You know, they were sharing ideas, studying precedents, you know, both kind of paper and physical, um, you know, of course, you know, sh sharing the same texts. Uh, <laughs> nice segue. So this is one of the texts that we're sharing, um, and this is Commu Community and Privacy uh, by Sir Shemayev 
who's a modernist architect, and Christopher Alexander, who is a kind of sociologist and architect. Uh, and they were really interested in, they were sort of reacting to the beginnings of modernism and its effect on the cities uh, that they were witnessing and on the environment. And uh, they were very much interested in, in historic cities and, uh, and the way that people live and, and what, what people need to be happy and healthy. Uh, now, these are two diagrams that we've taken from the book. Um, and one of them relates to uh, urban design. So you have uh, this idea of a sequence between the civic core of a city, which is, I suppose, all the public functions, uh, and then through the public realm, which um, Nee Brown would then take on to consider to be the streets of the city. Uh, and then you have the semi-public realm, uh, and then the private realm and the semi-private realm. That's the, the kind of order that Nee Brown kind of takes it in. And then, and then you have uh, this idea of intergenerational living within the dwelling as well, so pretty radical, uh, that you have the family hearth, which is um, the entire family, and you have family communality, which would be a space for the entire family to convene. And on either side of that, you have children privacy and adult privacy. Uh, so separate spaces for, for children and adults to, 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 to live. Um, and this is a section uh, through uh, Lee Brown's Winscombe Street, which is his first project uh, in Camden, uh, in a kind of backyard sort of site uh, on two tennis courts, uh, phased. Um, and uh, he takes this, these sequences, as you can see in the diagram. So you have the public realm, the street, uh, Winscombe Street, and then the semi-public realm, a forecourt uh, that just it, it forms a threshold between uh, private and public. Uh, you have the private realm, which is the dwelling, and then a communal garden at the back, which is the semi-private, um, well, yeah, it's considered to be the semi-private realm, so one of communality. Um, this is uh, a view of the interior, uh, and you can see the family communality story, which is uh, the kitchen and dining room, and then the staircase that kind of joins uh, the lower ground floor, which you can see in the section here, which is uh, dedicated to children and can be converted to a granny flat. Uh, so for elderly people or children, and then the top story, which is for the adults. Um, and then this is, uh, you can see the, the, the garden. So this amazing communal garden, you know, it's so much better than having, you know, five, separated compartmentalized gardens um, and uh, you can see this amazing staircase these staircases that wrap between the party wall line so they force you to have to kind of uh, wave to your neighbor and they you know it's this idea that you know it might not be the most convenient thing it's it's not kind of a private luxury but it but it obviously facilitates community which is really important um, so, so Camden, you know, is, is a kind of central London borough. It stretches right back from the centre through to, you know, Hampstead suburbs in the north. And consequently, you know, it's a very diverse borough. The borough was formed in 1965 by the joining of Hampstead, Holborn and St Pancras. Um, and in many ways, Camden's quite a sort of uniquely fortunate borough, as well as its kind of geographical location. Um, it was the third richest at the time in terms of sort of rentable value. Um, and it had a very young and ambitious Labour Council. Um, and at the centre of this kind of young, you know, ambitious council was Sidney Cook. Um, his years at Camden are quite kind of beautifully documented in Mark Swenerton's recent book, very well worth reading. Um, but Cook joined Camden as borough architect at this really exciting moment, and he helped to kind of guide this energy to lead this newly formed borough to kind of set a new standard in housing design. You know, I think Aidan and I see him you know, in as much as anything as a master sort of casting agent, what he's really great at doing is, you know, picking out some of the brightest young, you know, architectural minds of the day and providing them with this kind of nurturing environment that enables them to bring their kind of radical ideas to reality. Uh, so uh, I should have mentioned that we visit Winscombe Street in our Camden North tour. <laughs> uh, we also visit this project, which is uh, Fleet Road, also known as Dunboyne Road. And uh, this was, uh, so when Cook, uh, when Camden was formed and Cook became the borough architect, one of the first architects he, he hired was Neve Brown. Um, and um, this is uh, Neve Brown's first big estate. So he takes the ideas of Winscombe Street, 
uh, and he kind of fleshes them out and you end up with this extremely high density scheme. Uh, so this is kind of almost uh, Lee Brown uh, teaching everyone a lesson in the rest of the country to say that, you know, you can achieve extremely high densities. You can, ha you can have these amazing shared gardens. Everyone can have incredible private garden space and generous dwellings and it can all be low rise. Everyone can have a front door. Um, so this is an extremely unique um, and in many ways very successful project uh, and it becomes highly influential to the rest of the architects in Camden because it's well publicised in journals uh, of the day. So this and Alexandra Rhodes, uh, the drawings become, as Ros mentioned before, this idea of paper architecture uh, become a progenitor for other Camden schemes. Okay, so, so one of the schemes that's delivered by Cook's kind of young, super talented dream team is Highgate Newtown. And I think this is one that's, you know, on the tours at Eggnan, I never really get bored talking, we don't get bored talking about any of them. But, you know, this, this one, it's always a real kind of joy, you know, to share with everyone and, and to see how kind of excited pe people get. You know, it's got this quite wonderful setting. It's nestled into the south facing slope of Highgate Hill. It's got these kind of regular fins of Breton Brut that kind of struck, strike this, you know, really quite striking profile, um, which actually, you know, on a kind of sunny day, you know, they, this kind of light concrete almost picks up the light and they almost seem to glow. Um, next, Aidan. <laughs> um, so Tarbury is 26 when he begins working on Highgate Newtown, which is pretty young. Um, but despite his youth, he's not without experience. Um, he's, you know, either been taught by or worked with some of, you know, the most sort of eminent architects of the day. Um, when he was at Regent Street Polytechnic, which is now Westminster University, um, he was, you know, he was lucky enough to be taught by Richard Rogers, who became a very kind of influence, very kind of big influence on him, particularly his ideas about kind of density and the Italian hill town, which we can see um, played out in Highgate Newtown. But also, you know, if you go back one, Aidan, um, but also the, the image here is of um, Creek Van, which um, is Team 4's first built scheme that uh, Tarbury helped out on. And also, you know, as a student, he was lucky enough to have Dennis Lasden as one of his critics who was, you know, suitably impressed by his work to offer him a job. So, you know, as, when he graduates, he goes and works with Lasden for three years on the University of East Anglia, Anglia sorry, which is where you can see that he kind of picks up his expertise with concrete, which he then goes on to use in Highgate Newtown. Bingo. <laughs> um, so one of the lovely things about Highgate Newtown um, and something that's really key to, you know, Tarbury's thinking is, is this idea of the street and also the relationship between public and private. You know, one of the big criticisms of some of the, you know, mixed developments, you know, post-war is that they tend to kind of neglect um, the kind of 19th century urban context within, you know, which they exist within. Um, so Tarbury arranges his scheme. You can see three of the streets here, but they're actually, you know, there, there are six. Um, and he's, in this, he's very much kind of influenced by the work of Jane Jacobs at the time. You know, she's talking extensively about the street and how, you know, successful streets are collectively protected by kind of watchful neighbours. So he sort of, you know, he physically puts eyes on the street, as it were, you know, the kitchens overlook, um, overlook these streets in between the, the dwellings. And it is, you know, it's remarkably successful, you know, whilst I've been doing or, you know, we've been doing the research for these tours, you know, I've walked up there often, you know, in the afternoon, and on like a sunny afternoon, like, I, you know, it's, you know, it's full of life. There are children out there in paddling pools. You know, this space feels really kind of safe and inhabited. There are no kind of physical um, boundaries to the estate. You know, that there's, I think he does this kind of, you know, there's this level change which sort of subtly separates it from its context. The level change, you know, is to accommodate parking, which at the time, yes, is a, a council housing. It has to adhere to the Park and Morris standards, which include one-to-one -one parking. Um, so, you know, underneath the state, the estate, um, you know, it has provisions for one-to-one -one parking. Um, you know, which at the time, you know, it's it's not. It, I think one, you know, one of the other criticisms of a lot of the post-war estates is all this ground that gets alleviated ends up being kind of sprawling asphalt. Um, and car parking. Um, arguably though, you know, there have been some problems in the more recent past with antisocial behaviour in these, in these spaces. Um, so lastly, but I think, you know, one of the things that 
Tarbury's, I think, brilliant at, and this is a phrase I picked up from an old tutor, is the idea of economy and generosity. I, you know, I think, you know, these dwellings don't have a particularly generous footprint, but the way that he kind of moves space around in them makes them feel very generous. You've got these quite kind of compact kitchens at the back, but then what that gives you is the image you can see here where you've got this kind of open plan living space, which extends out onto the balcony. So your living space almost doubles in size. You know, the width, um, you know, the, the size of the, the balcony is defined by, you know, being enough to have a table and chairs out there. So on a good day, you know, you really can expand that living space. Originally, they were meant to be winter gardens. Um, I think it's actually maybe for the best that they, you know, that's one of the VE's fortunate value engineering. Um, and not to criticise our next walk, which has winter gardens, <laughs> um, but a beautiful segue. Um, yeah, so this is the interior, obviously, of the Brunswick Centre, and we visit this in our second walk, which Ros mentioned earlier, uh, which is the modern Camden South. So you can see that this is a much kind of denser scheme and a much more urban scheme. Um, we also uh, visit, this is a, 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 a housing estate or almost a terrace uh, at Millman Street. Um, and again, this is something that hasn't really, um, I, I've noticed a few Instagrams during lockdown of this project, but apart from that, <laughs> people don't seem to know much about it, but it was actually an early project by uh, Farrell Grimshaw Partnership. And again, it's, extre it's extremely high density, but at the same time, it ha all, the, all the dwellings have uh, dual aspects, um, uh, gardens, terraces, uh, and then you have communal facilities on the lower ground floor um, and a creche. Um, so it's quite successful in a lot of ways. It, they also play around with this idea of flexibility so that the council can adapt the dwellings to different sizes for different um, um, your occupation. And I think part of it's now used for elderly housing. So. And um, our Camden 2, Camden South, finishes up at Maiden Lane, um, which is, you know, the kind of the vision of Benson and Forsyth. It feels quite kind of out to the end there as it, you know, almost marks the end of the era of uh, housing that, that we're, we're talking about. It's the kind of final hurrah of, um, of Camden. And it, it's, quite a, it's quite a mixed story. You'll have to come on the tour to find out. But, um, you know, it's, it's got this kind of big, bold ambition, um, which is only in part realised. So I think we, we've decided to end with a quote, and this is a Nye Bevan quote, which you know, we just feel is quite kind of timely. Um, While we shall be judged for a year or two by the number of houses we build, we shall be judged in 10 years time by the type of houses we build. Um, so I, I, think, I think maybe for us, and I'm sure I didn't want to say something here, you know, the importance, we feel it's important to look at these um, precedents that, you know, that they, you know, they're, they're kind of really unique, you know, in what they challenge and they have this a real, really kind of strong social kind of driving ambition, you know, for quality, um, which we hope doesn't get lost. Yeah, and I, th I think, I mean, this is quite, it's almost platitudinous now because, because of the interest in these estates, but, um, but I suppose they've stood the test of time in a way that so many estates that were that had a different kind of agenda and, and were kind of I suppose uh, a more stark modernist modernism or, or or had less kind of investment in them um, have been demolished. So there's a, there's a longevity to these estates, which which um, I think obviously for us, I think that's obviously that's the reason why there's so much renewed interest in them um, because that's that's evident now. Absolutely, um, Aidan Rosalind. Thank you. That was a that was a fantastic presentation. A really delightful slides. Um, so, so these tours we've been working on together for I think about two years or more now, um, and uh, it's been a really great journey. And just like that presentation, it's been a great contribution to the output of the foundation. Um, how does it feel, I guess, having a break from them now? You haven't, you haven't done the event in a few months. Has it been a, a good break or are you missing them being out there? 
like I'm missing them. I feel that would have been easier if I'd just done one. Aidan and I were saying this last week, you know, it's been odd preparing for this because, you, you know, we're used to sort of meeting up what feels like almost every other weekend and having a walk and a talk around some of these, um, around some of these projects. Um, so I, I definitely miss it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think for me, um, I suppose the, the, the ability to be able to go out into the city and meet so many different kind of interesting like-minded or not like-minded people and to discuss a common interest um and also to feel like there's a certain level of optimism you know it's almost the cliche echo chamber <laughs> that we meet some people who are who are genuinely optimistic about the future of housing and where it could go uh even against the kind of political grain uh, and that's you know that's quite reassuring <laughs> but absolutely when it comes to architecture, we often think about getting out there, going on tours and research trips as being something that happens in the architecture school. But you're both young practitioners. And how do you feel, like, how does it actually work for you, um, like fitting around your work as young architects with researching, creating ideas for tours, and then actually delivering it on a regular basis and keeping that material fresh? How does it all fit together in this jigsaw puzzle? I suppose I feel like it really kind of feed, feeds in feeds into my work. Um, you know, I, I, I think both of us very much enjoy the research, you know, the discovery, the kind of bringing these things together, connecting the dots. Um, so it almost doesn't, it's, it's not like doing your homework or something like that. You know, I, I think we actively, you know, we both really um, enjoy it and really get excited by it. Uh, and it, it definitely informs, um, you know, the work that you do in practice, just because, you know, if anything else, you've got this amazing kind of bank of precedents that you've looked at, you know, in quite an intense amount of detail, you know, long kind of afternoons, you know, scanning in old articles of the AJ or, you know, AD in the Reba, Reba Library. Yeah, I, I think also like becoming intimate, for me, becoming intimate with buildings that you're not working on is so important. So, you know, you're, you're limited when you're, you know, when you're designing to, to, to the projects you have and being able to really explore projects that, you know, you could never work on <laughs> is super interesting because, you know, because there are lessons to be learned from all of these projects and maybe, you know, in the future, it could be really relevant to a project we're working on or, you know, it could be, it could be a bit more kind of uh, lateral, but, um, but for me, that, that's, that's, that's a fundamentally interesting aspect of it. I think it's very interesting what you're saying there, like a kind of idea of a duty and responsibility to get out there and engage with parts of the city that aren't directly your remit. And I think one of the amazing things that tours offer is the opportunity to say, go to a place you've never been, but go there on terms which are kind of productive and constructive. I mean, sometimes I've done uh, events, uh, sort of we, we devised as part of our tours programmes, events in places like, the Olympic Park or Canary Wharf, which is sort of objectively not that exciting places. But then there's a the feeling that if we live, if we exist in an era where things like this are produced, we, we, have, we have a kind of responsibility to go out there, engage with them and think with them. Um, certainly when it comes to you, you're going into environments which in our present situation are quite fraught politically and socially. Um, you know, it's, it's, you know, we've literally gone through decades of people like Lee Brown being maligned, you know, and, and, and their architecture being maligned. Do you find that um, there are certain sensitivities concerned when you take a group into an environment like one of these estates, often on a weekend, uh, you know, and, and, and present it to them as an artifact, but also a living part of the city? Yeah, I and mean, I think, you know, you have to be kind of incredibly sensitive when you're, you know, taking a group of people around, you know, it, for everyone else, it's their Sunday morning and they're just at home. Um, so I, I think, you know, that's something, you know, when, when we're planning them, we, you know, there's a lot of us standing in different locations trying to think, you know, how can you see the, you know, the best bit, the bit we're talking about without being on someone's doorstep or kind of, you know, in someone's way. And I have to say kind of, um, we've been incredibly lucky that, you know, residents that we've bumped into, you know, I feel like some of them know us now, um, have always been, you know, incredibly welcoming and really enthusiastic. Um, you know, they're, they're really up for talking to you. You know, I've not really had a, a, a you know, a bad, a bad experience, but I am always 
nervous of you know i'm always very kind of aware that we're infringing on people's sunday mornings their privacy you know um and you know that i don't know that i would love it if there was a tour outside my front door <laughs> um yeah i suppose yeah this is something that again we we as Rose says we've discussed quite a lot and that was always something that we thought was the most contentious part of giving these tours is this idea of a um infringing on people's space but also um are we um potentially do you become a vehicle for for ce celebrating this architecture in a way that is more part of this kind of fetishization of modernism um, well, like an in instagram culture yeah um, yeah and i, th I think we try to keep uh, the subject matter focused almost less on aesthetics like for us this, we do talk about style and we talk about aesthetics. But I think for us, it's, you know, like we like it aesthetically. That's subjective. Um, but we try to keep the subject matter on the importance of the architecture and on the social conditions in which uh, the, the architecture was made. Um, and, and try not to talk about the interesting wall textures too much. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know if that's answering your question, but. <laughs> I'd, I'd certainly agree that um, like taking people out to these spaces is a political act in itself. And certainly um, the fact that the existence of this event uh, is, 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 is making them uh, more prominent uh, in our world, but also beyond. Now, I would say in the two years that we've run this, and we, we did this tour every month, pretty much, uh, we must have had hundreds, if not thousands of people come on it. Um, do, you, do you get a kind of invite, insight to the sort of people who attended this event? Was it sort of different from what you might typically see at your average architecture lecture? Um, anything that took you by surprise? Anything that was all too typical? Um, I think when, when we first did it, I would say it was probably, you know, there were, there were more architects. What I've loved as the tour is evolved. You know, I kind of, we always ask a little bit about everyone at the beginning, and I kind of love it when it's not all architects because. I'm always having these conversations with architects and it's much more interesting to kind of widen that conversation. You know, we, we get a total mix from people who, you know, maybe work for a housing association, you know, developers, people on holiday, like, you know, and it, when it's a broad conversation, I, I think it becomes really interesting. And, you know, you end up, we, you know, we end up sort of learning um, very much through the questions that we're asked on the tour as well, I think. Yeah, I mean, like I, on the Camden tours, we've we've had engineers, we've had planners, we've you know people involved in government. Um, uh, I, I I feel like that the kind of melting pot of people is, as you say, completely distinct from most architecture events. I, when when I when I started doing tours with you, Merlin, uh, yeah. first tour <laughs> many moons ago, um, the first tour was in Westminster, and you got a mixture of architecture enthusiasts and then sort of royalists yeah i remember that <laughs> so i was trying to be you know um not to be too critical of of sort of booking in palace um but i think with the modern camden tours it seems like a more active group of people usually not to not to be um too too generalized you know generalized but that's but you could possibly say in our world there are many zeitgeists side by side and we've we focused on a different one uh, <laughs> but the um i mean certainly in this time in these recent years that you've been doing this we've had a new surge of interest so in part facilitated by the foundation by things like the neve brown lecture which um uh, had however many thousands of people in the audience um and project interrupted the publication uh which which basically um uh, it took, played a role in this new focus on the exact kind of architecture that you're discussing. I mean, has it, has it found its moment? Has it, has it found its moment even more in this kind of uh, pandemic era where healthy, healthy architecture, which basically should have always been important, uh, is, now, uh, is now being reappraised uh, in, along these exact terms that you've described? Well, I mean, I, so I think, you know, housing, uh, you know, maybe we didn't touch on it so much in our talk, but, you know, housing is kind of inherently political, you know, over the last kind of hundred years, it's, it's kind of, you know, done that, you know, gone to the top of the political agenda and then, and then, and then dropped again. But it's obviously at the moment, it's something that people feel very strongly about. 
And particularly at a moment like this, when we're all spending so much time in our houses, you know, the quality of that space, the effect that that then has on your mental health and well-being, you know, is really, you know, brought to the, to the forefront. You know, and a lot of the things that we, you know, these projects that we look at have very kind of, you know, they're, they're small moves. They're not such, you know, big, difficult things to do, but, you know, access to, you know, light, air, you know, you know, a bit of outdoor space, you know, all these things kind of really, you know, improve, you know, your day to day quality of life. Um, yeah. So, I, I, you know, I think, you know, the pandemic is going to bring lots of things to the surface, but yeah. Um, <laughs> But I think, you know, our kind of attitudes to housing, you know, again, will be one of them. Yeah, I, I, I think that just to add to that, I think there's a certain vindication again of, of this, of the architecture of this, uh, of this kind of period or, you know, of, of Cook's Camden, because, because obviously you have this, like this real kind of importance placed on front doors onto the street or not having internal corridors. Um, and if you look at, you know, the cultural history of, of, of England, at least, maybe not so much Scotland, um, but, you know, apartment living is, is relatively, you know, a relatively very new thing. The idea of, you know, sort of, you know, common lodging houses were kind of well known for being probably quite bad for spreading, for disease spread. Uh, and then you have the mansion block and from then, you know, that's kind of the culture of apartment living sort of starts. So it's, it's relatively new. And I'm not saying that's necessarily a bad thing, but um, potentially the idea of, you know, I mean, the, the COVID crisis at the moment is almost starting to prove, I don't want to, I'm not a scientist, <laughs> but it's starting to prove this idea that, you know, if you're touching the same sort of door as another 50 people, uh, and maybe five doors to get out from your, your, your dwelling to a shop, then that's potentially going to spread disease a lot more. Um, and if you're able to go from your house to a shop, and back and yet at the same time have a strong community so you can rely on people to look after your kids or whatever and um, then that's such a positive thing in this um, so I, I, I we haven't got any empirical evidence from the Cook Estates to say that that is a thing uh, and the science is still obviously clearly, clearly you know up in the air a tiny bit but it seems like that to me that seems to be the direction um, well, it, well certainly and I, I hope the solution isn't just private elevators to even more luxury penthouses um, because that would be a terrible wasted opportunity. Now look, we're on to the kind of architecture uh, of the discussion and there's uh, so many great questions coming in from the audience. So I'd, uh, I'd like to take a question from the great Alex Ely, uh, who's there. <laughs> can, we, can we unmute Alex, please? Hi. Um, great talk. Thank you. Can you hear me okay? Yes. yes. Aidan, Rosalind, it was lovely to hear about work that you know I kind of love and admire. Um, and I guess we all kind of get intrigued by the, the beauty and the complexity of what uh, Cook's elite of architects achieved. Um, and they were reacting against the zeitgeist of modernism. Um, but at the same time, they were working in a context. And I just wonder what your, either your reflections are or what you've learned from the reading of those architects, of what their understanding of sort of integration was, to what extent did they design with the setting um, and the neighbourhood in mind? Thank you, Alex. That was, that's a great question. Um, over, to, over to the duo. Shall I go first? Yeah. Okay, thank you very much, Alex. It's lovely to hear from you. Um, I don't know where you were, but I imagine the top of the Barbican, but what of you? <laughs> Is that the Barbican? Wow. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I suppose, yeah, that, that was a fundamental uh, interest, to, you know, for these architects, this idea of continuing um, the city in terms of, yeah, this idea of continuity with the existing city rather than rejecting uh, the city and Roz, I often let you do the quote from Le Corbusier. Oh, the, the street is a dysfunctional organ that no longer serves a purpose. That one, that's that, <laughs> that one of his quotes. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so I mean, I said the idea that the street was kind of redundant and that the, the scale of the city was, uh, was, was, was redundant and all these kind of things, um, obviously weren't we can say in, in hindsight probably weren't very helpful um, um, ideas or, or stances 
Um, and yeah, Neve Brown, uh, Tarbury, um, and uh, Benson and Forsyth, another great example, was so interested in keeping the, 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 the Victorian street pattern because that's what people are used to, that's what people uh, understand, and that's how our kind of culture has developed around, uh, or, or has been developed around. So, um, yeah, cult cultural continuity, I'd say, is probably the most important urban um, uh, contribution of these architects. Yeah, I, I think kind of like Aidan says, they, you know, there's a much more sensitive version of modernity. It's this kind of marrying the principles of modernism, but also kind of recognising the context in which they're working, which is the kind of, you know, the, the urban fabric of London. Um, and I think there's a really, what I suppose I quite like, you know, there's, there's no need to kind of reinvent the wheel every time. They kind of recognise what works in the context around them. You know, I think, I think you know, specifically, you know, there's a Benson and Forsyth um, scheme in Gospel Oak that does, you know, has the same kind of massing as, as its 19th century context, but, but it's, in, you know, it's kind of physically very modern at the same time. You know, it is kind of, it's this balancing between the two, um, you know, which I think, you know, this kind of set of architects are really good, really good at doing. I mean, yes. is, is there something to be said for the fact that it comes in itself with its unique opportunity that it gave them of this kind of dense development, but it wasn't too badly destroyed by the war? Um, other parts of London had similar ideas, but not really similar results at all. Yeah, you know, I, I think that, that, you know, there is, there's, you know, there's that kind of criticism, you know, the, the kind of some of those post-war estates really do ignore their surroundings. And I think what these ones do much more successfully, you know, is try and knit, knit back into the context a bit more. Um, which I think is something, you know, again, we're sort of looking at, you know, trying to provide housing, housing in, in London, but working with what's all, already there, this kind of term urban dentistry, you know, I feel is very much kind of back on, you know, back on the cards. And Aidan? Yeah, I sort of think, I think, because I always see it as a kind of proto-postmodernism in a sense. Mm -hmm. this, if you were to define postmodernism in architecture, you know, there are lots of definitions, but as taking modernism, but also critiquing it and moving from it. And I think that you have this period shortly after, um, you know, during, I suppose, the beginning of kind of uh, beginnings of neoliberalism, where people just throw modernism out the window, uh, throw the kind of baby out with the bathwater, and there's almost a regression in doing that, you know, because modernism in, in many ways was reflecting society and culture. Um, and these projects reflect both the existing city, but also these changes. And, and in a way, you can almost see more modernity or more kind of contemporary relevance to these schemes as you would to a lot of the kind of 1980s, 1990s schemes, for me at least. Yeah, certainly if you could imagine the kind of compare this to the Riverside development, which blighted much of London throughout those eras, uh, is a pretty dire comparison. Is there anything going on right now in London that um, gives you hope? I mean, we're going we're to touch on some of the stuff within the London borough of Camden in a second, but anything in other parts of London, new architects or developments which, uh, which appear to be obviously drawing on these precedents? I mean, I guess Peter Barber is an obvious example. Um, I think, that, I mean, yeah, but I mean, Peter Barber, again, I suppose in terms of, um, again, again, this kind of idea of creativity, which maybe has been lost from some contemporary architecture um, and, um, uh, and certainly pushing architecture in a way that maybe in other, you know, other kind of contemporary architects haven't pushed it. Um, I know that, you know, we've just spoken to Alex, uh, we mm. have, I know he's worked on some very um, uh, interesting um, house types in Agar Grove, which are mm. uh, split level and directly influenced from this period. Um, and Hayward Tompkins, some of their schemes, uh, or Howard Tompkins, some of their schemes in, in terms of the way that they relate to existing estates. Mm. Um, and instead of, you know, you know, Silchester is a good example. Uh, so we, we got a question um, from uh, Dave Harrison, who's been on our tours before, um, and uh, he's asking, um, he'd be interested to hear your both views on Camden's current approach to architecture and estates they're building. So obviously Agar Grove, uh, and he says thanks for the talk. Um, so 
So there is, there is quite a lot. Uh, there's quite a lot going on. I mean, I, I suppose Agar Grove and, and for me, the Summerstown stuff are the most obvious ones. I, I actually, the one that immediately jumped to mind was we did, you know, the, the tour of the Born Estate. Not we didn't, but att attended. I think, um, I, I, I suppose to me, I'm, you know, a born and bred Camden girl. <laughs> um, I feel that like Camden's quite kind of, as a borough, you know, quite kind of proud of its heritage in terms of housing, you know, and, and definitely, you know, um, you, you, I think we've seen, or we've seen kind of recent moves um, to kind of cont continue that. Um, you know, in, in Gospel Oak, there's obviously, there's some KCA, um, Karasakusevich Carson's projects, um, Peter Barber, again, I, th I think they're looking, yeah, I would say there's, you know, what's coming out of Camden now is positive, largely. Uh -huh. And I think you have to take it within the within the context in which it's made. So, uh, you know, for Camden, uh, as a result of a lack of funding and expertise and all these kind of things, Camden have had to kickstart a program of housing development uh, and they were left completely unprepared in a sense for it. So, you know, this is, you know, and since kind of 2010 sort of thing, Camden suddenly had to become a developer. Um, and in order to, to achieve that, they've had to build housing for private, um, you know, private market sale and rent. Uh, you know, the Camden collection is their, you know, uh, exclusive luxury housing uh, that kind of becomes a funding vehicle. And, um, and, and, and not all local authorities are able to do that. So Camden are in a specific situation where they were able to do it uh, and they had to potentially act almost like private developers in a certain kind of way in order to achieve the, 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 the social goals. But they, as, as local authorities go, they seem to be um, one of the most kind of optimistic and, and, and I suppose, trusting of, of, of architects and, and, yeah, and, and of new ideas. I think actually, but before, you know, like half an hour before we kind of did this talk, Aidan and I were saying how, you know, the projects that we look at are very much um, a product of their era. And then we were both kind of like, but why? Why couldn't you get that now? Why wouldn't you get that now? Or, you know, how, how, would, it be, how would it be different? And I suppose that is, you know, something to, to reflect on. Architecture is always kind of a product of now, of the kind of... Um, not the ideals, the priorities or whatever of, of that society. Um, mm. Well, it's certainly interesting because in your very beginning introduction, you talked about it as an era where technology was extremely influential, where there was a strong role for the state, for the government. And effectively, I mean, what do we have now? We have daily presentations with scientists, well, did press yeah. conferences next to politicians, and we're all desperately looking for a medical technology to save us from this bizarre predicament. So there, there are certain parallels. Uh, and I think in a way when we judge Camden for what it's doing now, we have to bear in mind that these very months through and now are a massive moment of flux and, and you know, new consensus will emerge. But certainly we can be, we can be sure that public, uh, public finances are stretched more than ever, especially at the local level. Um, we know that you know, capacity was limited even before this crisis, but at the same time our public spaces, our housing, everything is having to deliver uh, much more than ever before. So. Um, it's certainly good that we're having these discussions and I think that um, certainly anecdotally I would say that a lot of policy makers um, in, uh, and public sector workers have come on your tour and, and learned from it. Um, do, you, do you ever hear from any of them? Do they get in touch? Are people asking for plans and elevations and insights? Yeah, we often get drawing requests. Um, Aidan's usually the one that send, sends that out. Um, I think... <laughs> <laughs> so we've, we've got a few questions. We've got one from Jeffrey Goldberger. Mm -hmm. um, is it okay to, um, uh, please, Jeffrey, would you like to ask your question via Zoom? Yeah. Oh, hi. Um, yeah, I just wanted to know if you could discuss uh, the history of the socio-economical history of the neighborhood and uh, if there are concern, if there were concerns about these housing projects uh, kind of NIMBY types of concerns and alternatively um, gentrification concerns, um, perhaps more recently. Thank you. 
So I, I think at, at the time, um, one of the examples that we, we, we discuss, we cite, is the redevelopment of Gospel Oak. Um, the kind of redevelopment of Gospel Oak started, you know, really kind of at the end of the end of the Second World War. So prior to Camden um, starting, Camden being formed, but it, you know, it spans, you know, it, it spans from, you know, the late 1940s up to the early 80s, really. That you know, by the time you know the Benson Forsyth scheme comes in. But what's quite interesting when you look at the kind of reaction in the local community to that because you know this master plan takes so long by the time the kind of last pieces uh, started to be kind of built and fishy and actually the public reaction to what's happening to their neighborhood has really changed you know there's this you've gone through the whole fashion of no streets bring streets back you know there's a there's a kind of the kind of existing kind of urban fabric is is so much altered by this master plan that you know, there's this kind of optimism of all new housing, and then like, oh, but what happened to Gospel Oak? And you, you know, by the end of it, you get actually quite, you know, kind of an angry backlash and the residents group together and they stop a compulsory purchase order. And, you know, then on the council side, you have, you know, you know, Peggy Duff, who was part of Camden Council, kind of, you know, criticizing the locals as being, you know, a load of you know, middle-class something, something, something. Um, you, you, you do have these kind of battles. I, th I think Gospel is quite an interesting example just because it spans over such a long period of time and you've got, you know, changing kind of fashions as well as people just see their area just, you know, completely change beyond recognition around them. So, I mean, there, there are lots of different um, kind of forces, uh, you know, in, 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 these, um, in these redevelopments. Um, yeah, so... Yeah, so that's, I guess, like nimbyism. And then on the topic of gentrification, um, I suppose, yeah, when you look at Camden's uh, most kind of most recent projects, um, there is obviously an element of gentrification. I mean, Camden is um, an, a growing affluent area. And um, I suppose it's the council's responsibility to rehouse the people when they're redeveloping their estates, where a lot of other councils maybe haven't, haven't done that. Um, I think there's also a question of economy, though. Um, I know that in the Bacton estate, there was a CPO of industrial land um, and there is a reduction or there, there is a, a demand for industrial land now in Camden. So some of the types of jobs um, that potentially uh, uh, slow the kind of um, the, the, the problems of gentrification or you know, allow people to stay in their area or where they live. Uh, maybe uh, it, the economy is is a more kind of a pressing concern in Camden. Well, and also anecdotally, the, the real estate agents are telling us there's far more activity in industrial land sales than anything else right now, because it's it's all to do with distribution, uh, sorting out the new logistics of this bizarre situation we find ourselves in. So it'd be interesting to see how that then has an influence going forward, uh, especially on some of the, the sort of ideas that had been predicated on high residential land values. Um, so in terms of, are there any other buildings in Camden that you've never had a chance to, to really go deep on that you'd like to? I know that you, we, we discussed the, the Grimshaw supermarket at Camden Town once. Um, <laughs> with the residential elements along with... That was, that was cold because it was considered to be not interesting enough. <laughs> I think maybe just... A little bit marmite, I think, was the uh, yeah. Um, yeah. Well, we managed to get in somehow. We managed to get another Grimshaw project into one of our tours, uh, even though Farrell and Grimshaw both don't claim Millman Street on their website uh, <laughs> because it's probably not the type of architecture they they would normally make. We have a question from Vasav Vakilna. Um, uh, so I'm I'm going to to patch across. Uh, please ask your question. Hi, am I heard? Uh, yeah, we can hear you. Great. Uh, thank you for the wonderful presentation. Um, I'm, a, I'm an MPhil student at the AA, and I'm studying around the topic um, of social housing and impact on and also the garden cities and new town movements that counter um, the housing issues that are being raised. My question to you specifically for now is, there's a, we see a current trend about co-living and co-working spaces across Europe, uh, including uh, La Borda in Spain and 
um, like other such establishments. Um, with respect to um, social housing in London, would you see these models be evolved given the current housing needs into one of these um, like co co housing spaces because the opportunity is there given um, like the architectural spaces already exist? And I also reference to um, the Brunswick Centre being uh, remodeled into a more uh, commercially, uh, the central seat was remodeled into a commercial street and uh, it was sort of refurbished into a, in a different model than it was uh, previously to like during the 2000s. So um, what is your take on that? Do you see other models adopting this structure? Um, I would love to know your thoughts on this. Thank you. Um, I, I just, I think it's just one of them. Um, thank you. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Um, <laughs> one of the things I always say in regards to housing is that it's bit like it's horses for courses. There's never going to be one housing model that fits everyone. You know, therefore, there's, there's to, you know, there's so yeah, there's space for diversity within it. Um, so whilst the idea of communal living, you know, may not suit everyone there are sort of models, particularly for kind of young working people or young creatives who, who are much more up for that kind of flexible um, communal way of living. You know, I, th I think it's, there's, um, yeah, I think culturally in the UK, we're probably a little bit cautious of that. Um, but that doesn't, you know, tr trends change. Um, so, I, you know, I think whilst it may not uh, be, you know, it may not be one for the masses, I think there's definitely, you know, in our kind of changing urban environment, there's, there's definitely space for that kind of exploration. I think, I think, I think young people are, uh, are searching for these kind of uh, mm. alternatives. So I think there is a demand there. I, d I don't think the demand is enough to be kind of... Um, you know, Owen Hatherley writes about this, I don't think it's going to solve the housing crisis, co-housing, but I do think that there is, there is a, a demand. Um, but at the same time, I think the, the problem often, often is land and the availability of affordable land and the kind of scale of site that you can actually develop into this type of housing. Um, so I, we, we are connected with people who are trying to initiate these kind of things uh, using models like community land trusts, um, but, but they do struggle to, to kind of get them off the ground.